Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. I do want to remind you that we offer several great t-shirt designs that are available, particularly as these warmer months are coming up, and we've got four different designs, including our Johnny Dollar Anniversary shirt and our General Great Detective shirt. You can find all those at t-shirt.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, the original air date, January 20th, 1957, and the title is The Blooming Blossom Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Paul Brennan, Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Johnny. Oh, hi, Paul. How's the world doing by you? Oh, I got troubles. Oh, like what? Like Albert W. Winkler. Winkler? Who's he? Maybe you mean who was he? Well, which is it? Well, that's the trouble, Johnny. We don't know. Huh? Well, he's disappeared, and with him, a hunk of emerald worth exactly 100,000 clams. Wow. Well? Sure. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Dawson Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Blooming Blossom matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even. Taxi from my apartment to the offices of Inter-Allied, where Paul Brennan wasted no time in getting to the point. Albert Winkler was a partner in a small jewelry firm down in New York. Real exclusive type place. Lord and Winkler? Yeah, that's the outfit. Well, a few days ago, they got hold of an emerald. It's called the Green Eye of Calcutta. And Johnny, the darn thing's big enough to choke a horse. Okay, Paul, okay. I don't think you need to go any further. No, wait. They plan to put it on an exhibition at the big international jewelry show in Chicago next month. And Winkler took it home to work on it. Oof. Insured for 100000 you said. Yeah, and Winkler's insured for ten. Okay, so who killed him and stole the rock? Listen, will you? Go ahead. Well, Sunday morning, his partner Blewett tried to phone him at his apartment. So Blewett sauntered down to the office thinking he might be there. But no sign of him? Right. Nor of the green eye of Calcutta. Only a note Winkler had left the night before saying he was taking the stone home to work on it. Well, that makes it look as though maybe Winkler... Listen. About that time, the phone rang there in the office. It was the police department also looking for Winkler. Oh. Yeah, they'd been called by Winkler's landlord after a chambermaid had found his apartment completely ransacked and the old boy missing. Uh Uh-oh. Who's working on it? For the NYPD, I mean. Uh, Sergeant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct Homicide. Old friend of yours, I believe. Yeah, good man. Has he come up with anything? Nothing. Well, Johnny? Sure, Paul. Now? Now. (laughs) Item two, another dollar for a taxi back to my apartment where I slicked the stubble off my face, showered, dressed, and was about to head for New York when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Oh, good. Well, who's that? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Dollar. Huh? I must talk with you, sir. It's important, very important. Well, who are you? Me? (laughs) Well, this is Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom. Yes, and I must see you right away. Well, what's this all about, Mr. Uh, Blossom, did you say? Why, that's right. How did you know that? Oh, 
Is this some kind of a gag? It certainly is not. And to think that now I'll be working with you on a... Oh, it's wonderful, just wonderful. What are you talking about? Why, you, don't you see? I follow every single one of your cases, sir. Either in the newspapers or on the radio. Oh, I'm your biggest fan. Is, uh, is that all you call to say, Mr. Blossom? It is not. I'm calling about the mysterious disappearance of Mr. Albert Winkler. Winkler? You know something about him, his whereabouts? I certainly do. Where are you, Mr. Blossom? Uh, here at my house in New York, and I'll be waiting for you, sir. Goodbye. No, wait. Give me your address. Oh, oh yes, of course. How could you know where to come if I hadn't given you that? Yeah. <laughs> that was silly of me. Well, goodbye. The address, man, the address. Oh, oh of course. Yeah. It's 825 East 73rd Street. <laughs> Item three, $9.20, transportation and incidentals to New York City and 825 East 73rd Street. It turned out to be one of New York's famous old brownstone houses, well-preserved and reeking of an era long past, when the city's wealthy and elite had built row on row of these monuments to a now-forgotten financial aristocracy. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in. I'm Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom. And I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to be working with you on this. I don't know how to describe it, but I'll try. The inside of Blossom's home was unbelievable. Ornate pre-Victorian furnishings, heavy velvet draperies, huge lamps and chandeliers, gilt frame mirrors, even an ancient horsehair sofa. It was also filled with dusty piles of newspapers and magazines, hundreds of old books. Travel books, Mr. Dollar, and mysteries. Oh, I just love mysteries. One corner of the high ceiling living room was piled with old trunks and handbags, an old carpet bag even. Boxes of tools and utensils were stacked about, an ancient Victrola, beat up sewing machine. You just never know when you might want to sew something, do you? Old guns and pistols, some of them museum pieces, a stringless tennis racket, a pair of rusty handcuffs locked to the base of a floor lamp without a shade. A broken bicycle pump. That's just in case I ever find a bicycle to go with it, you understand. Uh, yes. Against one wall stood an old metal cabinet loaded with rusty surgical instruments and a worn-out catcher's mitt. Yet directly opposite was a corner shelf full of priceless porcelain figurines and rare pieces of china. Some of the old clocks and jewelry on the mantelpiece were collector's items. Fine original oil paintings lay among piles of old shoes. All in all, it looked as though the contents of half a dozen pawn shops had been dumped into it. At auction sales, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, sir. I just cannot resist an auction sale or a bargain. But what are you going to do with all this stuff? Oh, just keep it. I like it. I like a lot of things. Yeah, so I see. Including 12 gross of Spencer's superlative steel tip shoelaces patented 1841. They were a bargain, Mr. Dollar. Just like all this fine artwork is, too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Some of my friends pamper me a bit, though. You know, send me things they pick up at sale. Yeah, now look, Mr. Blossom, you told me you know something about Albert W. Winkler. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Well? And think of that magnificent emerald. God. Disappeared. Yeah, but now you said... And that poor intra insurance company. Oh, my... That's how I knew you would be called on this case. But a hundred thousand dollars... And ten thousand dollars on Mr. Winkler. Well, at least they're off the hook on him until he's proved dead. Aha. And that's where I come in. With proof. Proof? What proof? Have you seen Winkler? Mr. Dollar, I have. Well, where is he? You understand, of course, that I know Mr. Winkler very well because I've seen him at his office so many times. Yeah, okay, go on. Oh, yes, indeed. Such beautiful, beautiful jewelry he had there. And, of course, he was always trying to buy some of the things I But had. you say you've seen him. Where? Well, Saturday I'd planned with a couple of old friends to attend a railroad auction. Uh, that was the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad. Winkler was there at the auction sale? Oh, uh, yes. Did you speak to him? Oh, no. Well, why not? You said you knew him. Oh, I didn't go to the auction. I wasn't feeling very well that day. I had a little... <clears throat> a little cough. <sighs> It was kind of like that. Then how do you know he was there? My friends went, and at least they talked about going. Mr. Blossom. And I'm sure they did, too, because they sent me something from... And what do you suppose it was? I don't know. I don't care. Now, look here. You got me It was the very thing that has solved this whole case for you. What? And think of it. This dull, drab, dreary life of mine has suddenly become... Why, it's almost like a mystery story, isn't it? Adventure and... Look, Mr. Blossom, would you... Think of it. I'm being a detective. I'm working with my idol, the famous Johnny Dollar. 
Oh, George. Mr. Blossom, what did they send you? What's that? Oh, oh yes, of course. Uh, uh, here. Here it is, sir. It's right here between the erector set and the golf clubs. This old trunk? That's right. Great Scott, you think you do. At first, of course, I, I thought of calling the police. But knowing all about you... Mr. Blossom, let me see that. Excuse me. There are a lot of crumpled newspapers on top. Yeah, I see. As old as the trunk. Good Lord. It, uh, it isn't pretty, is it? Sergeant Randy Singer, homicide. Randy, Johnny Dollar, get somebody over to 825 East 73rd Street right away, will you? Body of Albert Winkler. Randy got there in a matter of minutes, got the same story from Blossom that I had, then called for the lab crew to come and take over. Now, now, who delivered this trunk, Mr. Blossom? Well, it was just, uh, just a delivery man. Can you describe him? Would you know him if you saw him? Yeah, well, he was big and strong. He was very strong. Distinguishing features, scars or a limp or a beard or well, something? Well, I told you, Johnny, he was big and strong. How old? Well, I would say he was somewhere between 25 and, um... Yeah? 50. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Well, that's a lot of help. Yeah, you better have those thick spectacles changed. But he was big. Yes, we know, and strong. What about his truck? Oh, I didn't see that. He left it outside. No. Now, look. These friends of yours who did attend the auction, who were they? Oh, oh yes. Now the investigation proceeds. Now the excitement... Who were they, Mr. Blossom? Uh, oh. Well, there's uh, Randolph Harrison and Christopher... Randy Singer took down the names of Blossom's three auction-minded friends. The lab crew arrived. Randy took off to dig up Blossom's friends, and I took a cab. That's item 480 cents to the apartment of Elwood Blewett, Winkler's partner in the jewelry business. Blewett lived alone in a modest but tastefully furnished five or six rooms on East 52nd Street. Of course, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to help you all I can. Albert's death has been a terrible blow. Yes. Well, tell me this, please. Yes? Did Mr. Winkler make a habit of taking valuable pieces of jewelry to his residence? Yes, Albert often took pieces home with him to work on them, clean, polish, and so on. Wasn't that a rather dangerous practice? Frankly, I always thought so, but he felt there was far more chance of being robbed if he were alone at the office than at his flat, where he wouldn't be expected to have anything of great value. Well, who has seen the green eye of Calcutta besides you and Mr. Winkler? I'm not sure. Of course, almost anyone would have been able to recognize it. Because of the publicity and pictures when you brought it over here? Yes. Come to think of it, Blossom indicated he'd been much impressed with it. Wilbur Blossom? Yeah. You know him? He's been in the office many times. He and Albert were always bickering over pieces that either bickering? of us... Bickering? Well, it was really something of a joke. Albert always wanted some of Blossom's heirloom pieces, and Blossom wanted some of the finer things we had. Did he ever buy? Never. He always wanted us to put them up at auction or at a bargain price. Hardly our way of doing things, needless to say. When did you last see Blossom? By last Friday. I was busy with an important client, and from the back room where Albert worked, I remember hearing Blossom insist that Albert show him the emerald. What did he? I don't know. The silly argument got so noisy that I closed the door on them. Hmm. Oh, now wait. Certainly you aren't thinking that perhaps Wilbert Blossom... I'm not quite certain what I'm thinking, Mr. Blewett. <laughs> Item five, ten cents, phone call to Randy Singer. No, not a thing, Johnny. One of the three names on Blossom's list is in Europe. The other two did go to the railroad auction, but purchased nothing. Randy, do a couple of things for me, will you? Like what? Phone whoever is stationed at Winkler's place that I want to look it over. Sure, everything is just as it was, including the poker that was used to kill him. Also, I want a copy of the picture of the trunk your lab boys took and the list of Blossom's friends. I'll have them waiting for you. And post a man at Blossom's place. Keep an eye on him. Hmm? Yes, right away. Johnny, have you learned something? That... No, no, just, uh, well, just for his protection, say. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, but I... Blossom. Yeah, Blossom. Maybe I hadn't given enough thought to the strange little character. Or to why the trunk with Winkler's body had been at his place. But if he were involved, why call me in? 
cover-up? Possibility. But Wilbert Blossom kill a man? Yeah, maybe he could. Maybe he did. I'd better see him as soon as I get through with the inspection of Winkler's apartment. Mr. Dollar? Oh, hi, officer. Did Sergeant Singer call and tell you that... He's on the phone here in the Winkler apartment now. Wants to talk to you. Says it's very urgent, sir. Okay, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, how did you know? Huh? The man I sent to cover Blossom's house for you got there too late. What? Whoever got in and attacked the poor old coot got away. Attacked? Blossom? Yeah, I really did a job on him. Johnny? <sighs> okay, Randy. Thanks. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. As everyone knows, democracy means many things. Self-rule of the people, a higher standard of living, freedom of speech, press and religion, rights and privileges, liberty. But the most vital promise of democracy is mankind's right to dignity. For it is through the dignity of man that democracy has given mankind its greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Blooming Blossom Matter. Expense account item six, two dollars and a quarter for a fast taxi ride to 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. All right. As soon as I got your call, Johnny, I sent a uniformed man over to Blossom's house. From the way you talked, I thought maybe you suspected him. Yeah, Randy, I'm afraid I did. Boy, how wrong can you be? Anyhow, when he got there, he found the front door open and Blossom lying in the dark hallway. Where's Blossom now? In the hospital, but he's okay, just bruised up a bit. They're letting him out. Fingerprints? Anything to go on? The lab's checking on the prints right now. Uh-huh. Let me know. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. So, now let's find out who tried to put Blossom out of the way and we'll have the guy who killed Winkler. And stole the 100000 worth of emerald, then shipped Winkler's body to Blossom. Oh, uh, and by the way, here's the picture of the trunk you asked for and the three names Blossom gave me. Harrison, Norton, and Scatterday. What are you going to do with them? Randy. Hmm? Suppose the man who attacked Blossom is the one who did all the rest. You got a better suppose? Well, look, Randy, whoever wielded that poker on Winkler couldn't have been very strong. A really hefty wallop would have bent it out of shape. And the lab agrees with you. But, of course, it didn't take much of a blow to finish off old Winkler. He didn't weigh much over 100 pounds, you know. Yeah. Any strong arm could have finished him off easily and without messing up the whole apartment. And don't forget, whoever did him in also put him in the trunk and delivered it to Blossom's house. But why? Yeah. Yeah, and where's the emerald? That's what you should be worried about. A hundred grand worth of worry for your insurance company. Now, what are you going to do with that picture of the trunk and the list of Blossom's friends? Oh, yeah, sure. Hmm? I'll see you later. Item seven, five dollars and a half for a taxi to the warehouse of the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad over in Jersey. There I finally managed to track down a man who knew something about their occasional auction sales of unclaimed baggage and stuff. Insurance investigator, eh? Huh? That's right, Mr. McKinney. One of those boys with a fancy expense count, eh? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Look, you had an auction sale here last Saturday, didn't you? That's right. Handled it myself. Want to know something about uh, something we sold off? Exactly. Then I'm your man. Always remember all about every single item I sell and who bought it and, and all about them. That's fine. Because I want to know if any of the names on this list bought from you on Saturday. Yeah. Randolph Harrison. Man by the name of Harrison buy anything? Mm, no. How about Percival Wentworth Scatterday? Nope. Ellsworth Norton. Nope. You sure, Mr. McKinney? I'm sure. How, uh, how about Blossom? That a man's name? Yes, Wilbert Blossom. Well? No, sir. Nope, never heard of him. And like I told you, I never forget the stuff I sell or the fellas I sell it to. Wait. This picture of a trunk. Huh? Have you ever seen this trunk? Well, yeah. Did you sell this trunk on Saturday? Yes, I did. To whom? Come on, man, it's important. Well, uh, now, I was real early in the sale. Yeah, before most of the people got here. Uh, bought this trunk and had it sent to his apartment in New York. And his name? Well, it was a funny kind of name. Uh, Blinky or Winky or... Uh, oh, no. Winkler. Winkler. That was it. Albert Winkler. Winkler. <laughs> 
I'd have made two dollars, two drinks for myself at the nearest bar. But they didn't help to kill my feeling of utter frustration. Item 9, 550 taxi back to 18th Precinct headquarters in New York for want of a better place to go. Well, it's about time you got here, Johnny. Oh? Uh, we matched up the prints we found after Blossom was attacked. You know who made them? Yeah, here's his card. Carlo Bernasconi. Any reckon? A couple of a dozen arrests, only one conviction. Anything to do with jewelry? Better. Accessory to a hijack operation a couple of years ago. He drove the truck. Hey. Sure. Got a mugshot of him? We got him. Downstairs. Come on, I'll take you down. Randy, what's he look like? Like you'd expect the truck driver to look, big husky brute. Has he admitted anything? Well, the threat of a murder charge made him talk, all right, but none of it makes any sense. Of course it doesn't. But he's our boy, all right. He killed Winkler, beat up Blossom. I thought your lab decided whoever killed Winkler was a small fella. Mm, yeah, I So the theory about the same man killing Winkler and beating up Blossom doesn't work. But Johnny, holy... Come on down, let's talk to this Bernice Cone. After I make a phone call. Huh? Who to? Yeah? Get me a man named McKinney. Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad Warehouse over in Jersey. Make it fast, please. Yes, sir. Hey, you been over there, Johnny? Just before I got here. Did you find out anything? No, but I'm going to now. Like what? Randy, for the first time, this whole thing is beginning to make sense. Here's your party. Mr. McKinney? That's me. This is Johnny Dollar, remember? Sure do. Good. And say, now... I've been reading in the paper since you left here about that body found the trunk over there in New York. Yeah, well, look. In that same, is that the same trunk you was over here asking about? Yes. Now, you told me that trunk was bought by a man who gave his name as Winkler. That's right. Do you remember what he looked like? Sure do. Why, I can give it to you as accurate as if it was in the police files. Well? Height, uh, mm, five foot nine, maybe nine and a half. Go on. Weight, between 155 and 58. You see, when I was young, I worked with a carny show guessing weight and height, and if I didn't guess it right... Yeah, okay, okay. Now, how about the uh, color of the eyes? <laughs> well, I noticed them because of the way he squinted through them thick, old-fashioned steel glasses. He... Thanks, Mac. I'm sending you a ten spot in the next mail. Well... Well, Johnny? Come on, Randy. Let's go down and see this Bernasconi. You find something out new? Yeah. And I don't like it. I don't like it. Now, look, Bernasconi, you're in plenty of trouble for the assault on Blossom. Maybe even more. But I'm the man who can save you from a murder rap. If you'll answer a couple of questions. Ah, uh, sure. I told the cops. All right. All right. Did you pick up and deliver a trunk yesterday morning? Sure, I told him. For a guy named Winkler. You got the trunk from Winkler? Sure, at his apartment on East... What did he look like? How tall? Oh, uh, maybe five, eight, or ten. What? Johnny... Slight that... build or heavy or what? I'd say about medium. Maybe 150 pounds. Johnny... Now, look, mister... Now, wait a minute, you look. Did you deliver that trunk to a man named Blossom? Sure. At 825 East 73rd Street. What did he look like? Him I never seen. I knew it. He hollered from a window that the door was open and I should put the trunk in the living room. <laughs> what a junk house. But you must have seen him later when you came back and assaulted him. It was night then. When he come to the door, I just slugged him and let him lay there. Then I went inside where the lights was on to look for... Well, to look for the big rock I'd read about in the paper. Then I heard a prowl car coming, so I beat it. Trunk wasn't there anyway. Okay, Bernasconi. See you later, Randy. Now, just a minute. Hey, and what about me? You said it... Item 10, 90 cents, taxi to Wilbert Blossom's old brownstone house on East 73rd. Come in, come in, Johnny. Thanks, Mr. Blossom. All recovered from your beating? Oh, of course I am. Here, sit down, sit down. You, uh, you said you wanted to help me on this case. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Why, this chance to work with a man I consider the finest insurance investigator in the world. Yeah. That's why I called you when I got the trunk with Mr. Winkler's body in it. Mr. Blossom, why don't you tell the truth? All my drab, dull life, I've wanted to be a detective, an investigator. And this was my chance. My chance to... Tell the truth, did you say? (sighs) Mr. Blossom, listen to some facts for a minute and see what conclusions you draw from them. Oh, deductions. (laughs) Like a detective. To begin with, this house of yours is so full of, well, junk. I told you, Johnny, I like things. I like things. But it also has a lot of fine paintings, sculpture, china, jewelry. Oh, I like all sorts of things, especially if they're fine and rare and bargains. (laughs) Like the green eye of Calcutta? Oh, the most beautiful emerald in the world. 
And I would conclude that you'd do just about anything to have that stone. Yes, sir, Johnny. I'd reach the same conclusion. Okay. Now, when Albert Winkler and the emerald disappeared, it was in the papers that Inter-Allied had written policies on them. Conclusion? Yes, sir. I would deduce that you would be called in. Wouldn't it be smart, then, if the killer was afraid I'd eventually get around to him anyway? Wouldn't it be smart for him to call me in and offer to help me? As a cover-up for what he'd done? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. Or at least he'd think it would. Oh, yes, I... I guess he thought it would. Another thing, Mr. Boss. Oh? What is it, Johnny? The body was packed in the trunk with old newspapers. Like these you keep piled around. Oh, I yes, yes. And I it's would deduce... so that obvious you... that both Randy Singer and I overlooked them completely. Oh, well, there are so many things piled around it. <laughs> you couldn't be expected to... Johnny. Yeah. What really made you decide that... Uh... Well, I'd like to know. All right. Albert Winkler was a frail little old man, about 4'11", not much over 100 pounds. Yes, he was. But the man who bought the trunk and had it sent to Winkler's apartment, who gave his name as Winkler, that man was about 5'9", 155 pounds. And he wore thick, old-fashioned, steel-rimmed glasses. Oh, but, Johnny, I can't see without them. Then there's the truck driver. The man who ordered the trunk delivered to this house gave his name as Winkler, too. But Winkler was dead by then. Dead from a blow inflicted not by some big bruiser, but by somebody of, say, your build. Oh, that awful truck driver who thought the emerald would be in the trunk and came here to steal it and who beat me up. I suppose you want the emerald. Yeah. Here, Johnny, I... I kept it in this old coffee pot uh, that I picked up at an auction sale. Real bargain, too. Oh, isn't it a beautiful stone? Oh, if only Mr. Winkley would have sold it to me. At a bargain, that is. Then none of this would have happened. Well, I guess we better go now, haven't we? Huh. It's such a silly thing. Me trying to act like a detective. I guess I didn't even make a very good killer, did I? Why? Just this overpowering passion to have things? Maybe. Or maybe it was just a reaction. A last desperate attempt to some way, any way, break from a lifetime of lonely, dull, drab idleness. I don't know. But for some crazy reason, I feel sorry for the funny little old character who turned killer. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare back to Hartford, $61.55. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case so simple, so easy, so obvious, that it proves almost impossible to solve. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Howard McNear, Herb Ellis, Herb Bygren, Junius Matthews, Herb Butterfield, Frank Gersel, and Johnny Jacobs. Musical supervision is by Jerry Goldsmith. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Welcome back. A significant story for Johnny Dollar, if for no other reason that it introduced the concepts of Johnny's adventures being on radio in universe. It wasn't totally unheard of on Sam Spade, the existence of a radio program, and Howard Duff playing Spade was a bit of a running gag. Ellery Queen's radio show was actually used as a plot point in at least one episode where Ellery had to solve the murder of an armchair detective. However, throughout the rest of the Bailey years, and I think a few times after that, the idea of him being on the radio would come up repeatedly in the program, and it would develop as time went on, and we'll discuss those changes as we get to them. As for the story, I think it managed to do a good job double bluffing us, making us think that Blossom did it, and then making us think he didn't, uh, and then that realizing that he did do it. The conclusion reflects the fact... Uh, Johnny's reaction to Blossom's guilt, that he generally cares for people and has a big uh, place in his heart for eccentric characters, and clearly Mr. Blossom fits into that category. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we've got a comment from Aisha regarding the Squad Room episode Old Woman Found Shot on YouTube. Aisha writes, as always, appreciate you sharing these episodes. I'd never heard of the show before. Well, thank you so much, and so glad to be able to bring a rare show to folks' attention. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day, and I want to go ahead and thank Larry. Larry's been one of our Patreon supporters since July of 2023, currently supporting the podcast at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Larry. And that will actually do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those are great things that help YouTube channels to grow. We'll be back next Friday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet Wear. Oh, the gun. Can't talk too well. No, don't try to get up, Major. How's Lieutenant Kelly? He was with me. He'll be okay. They're getting him in the ambulance. We were hitchhiking downtown, Kelly and me. Two men in the gray sedan picked us up. Said so they were going back to the fort. How were the men dressed? You remember? Too much noise. What did you say? Just a minute. What was that? The PE train going by. Now, can you tell us about it? Enlisted men. What is it? Tech sergeant, you know, a private. He said they'd drive us back to the fort in a gray sedan, Pontiac. Excuse me, sergeant. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll have to take care of those face wounds. You can go ahead. Okay. Did you see the license number on their car? Too dark, no. Gray sedan. Pull guns, stop the car here. Took our money, everything. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.